Danke. Danke. Ah, danke. So, Bill, thank you very much for doing this. Um, you uh, are very famous for, among other things, not having graduated from Harvard. Um, have you ever thought what you could have made of yourself had you actually <laughs> actually stayed and got your degree? Well, two times ago when I was uh, last in this hall, I was giving a speech and Mark Zuckerberg was in the audience. So I, I got him to drop out. Uh, uh, but truthfully, you know, I ended up going a total of three years, and I took a lot of courses. So I'm not really a dropout in the sense that, you know, I fled the university. I, had, I was having so much fun. It was just that it seemed like unless we got in on the ground floor, we were going right. to miss the opportunity. Well, when you applied to college, you applied to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And suppose you hadn't gotten into Harvard, and you only gotten into Yale and Princeton. <laughs> Do you think the value of being a drop out of Yale or a drop out of Princeton would have been <laughs> as valuable? Well, there's the prestige of turning Harvard down, which right. I don't have that. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you got, famously, you got, did, you did very well in standardized tests. You got 1590 out of 1600. Have you ever thought what that question was that you got wrong? Well, the truth is, I went, that was the verbal SAT. I got 790 the first time. I told my parents their vocabulary wasn't large enough, uh, and I was criticizing them. So I did go back and take it and do better the oh, next time. Should, oh, so yeah. you okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so when you were at Harvard, you did enjoy it, but you were famous for playing a lot of poker, famous for auditing a lot of courses, and famous for not attending the courses that you were supposed to be taking. So what would you say was the great experience you had and what you learned the most out of Harvard? Well, you know, when you come to Harvard, there's so many brilliant people. And for a lot of people in your high school realm, you, know, you probably have fairly key, key positioning. You're one of the more studious, one of the better at math or science. You have something that, you know, people uh, understand your, your positioning. Well, when I came to Harvard uh, in my freshman class, we had 80 people in one class, all of whom personal positioning was, I am the best math person. And so we had 79 frauds, uh, and so I thought, well, I'm probably not going to be the best at this. In fact, a uh, great guy, uh, Andy Braderman, who's a lawyer in New York, was first in that class. Uh, so I decided I would be the guy who never attended any class he was signed up for. Uh, so within my first month, I figured out that was my unique positioning, uh, and I hope that 80 other people wouldn't steal that positioning, but it, it turned out uh, I, uh, no one else imitated me. But you, you started out you were going to be a math major, and you finally realized there might be somebody better in math, so you decided to be an applied math major. Is that true? Well, there were certainly people better than me at math. I mean, I took the Putnam and uh, scored well, but not at the top. The main reason I switched to applied math was that Harvard had the strange rule that you if you were trying to get into a class, like some movie class or political science class that was very crowded, you could, if you were in applied math, you could pretend to be applying math to that domain right, and be right. treated as though you were a student majoring in that field. But they never pinned you down, so you could use right. it as a kind of wild card. Uh, okay. And there were a bunch of economics courses I wanted to get into, including Mike Spence's uh, microeconomics course, that I would not have been able to get into I unless I could say I was applying applied math to economics. So it was a great choice. Okay. So um, you, when you gave your, uh, you received an honorary degree from Duke, from, uh, from Harvard a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> His, his, wife, his wife went to Duke. She has a real degree. Actually, right. she has two, uh, both from Duke. His wife got the honorary degree from Duke this year, and you got an honorary degree a few years ago from Harvard. And in that, you said um, that you wanted to be in Radcliffe, uh, the dorms, because you, you concluded that there were more women than men there, and you had a better chance of um, scoring a date if you were in Radcliffe. Well, and still a very, very low chance, but... So it didn't work out. <laughs> 
So they had hamburgers too. You could get hamburgers for lunch no matter what they were serving. That was so, exciting. So um, <laughs> obviously you famously left um, Harvard. Your parents, when you called your parents up and said, look, I'm going to drop out of Harvard, uh, what did they say? Well, you never say that you're dropping out of Harvard. Uh, you know, I went on leave from Harvard. And so if things hadn't worked out for my company, uh, for Microsoft, I could have always come back. Uh, now, eventually, they changed the course catalog and requirements enough that right. nobody would know what it would mean. And I was so close to graduating. So, you know, my parents probably thought within a year or so the thing would, would collapse and I'd it'd be like a, a year off, like studying abroad or something. Right. But had, uh, the truth is, had you graduated and stayed, would it have made a difference? In other words, would the world be different because you couldn't have started your company by graduating, having not dropped out or not? No, it turns out that the urgency we felt that if we hadn't started in 1979, if we'd waited and started in 1980 or even 1981, uh, because of the way we thought about the problem, because we you know, were so software oriented and thought, it, and, and most companies weren't focused on software. People did software sort of a, a side deal because they had to, but the hardware was what you paid all the money for, the software just came free. So the idea of software companies uh, wasn't around all that much. So we, in fact, although we felt like we had to do it that day, uh, an extra year would have, would have, have been made a okay. Difference. Yeah, okay. it wouldn't have changed the, the course of history to, to hang out another year. Okay, so when you started your company, uh, you were the chief software engineer, in effect, architect, and you were also the CEO. Um, when you started it, uh, to be realistic about it, did you actually ever think it could take off to the extent it did, or what did you think the realistic goal was? Well, I had what you might call an inconsistent view, which worked out very well. One view was that there'll be a computer on every desk and in every home running our software. And so that would be, you know, billions of copies of our software, and that our, we should do everything for that. But then when it came to spending money, renting things, I had a view that, okay, maybe we could triple in size. And I ought to do enough in terms of how I structured things to triple in size. Uh, so that was kind of my man, there was my vision, which was grand, my management view, which was to triple. And then there was my, okay, do we have enough cash if nobody pays us? Uh, so I always like to have, because we had a few customers go uh, bankrupt, because. Uh, being in the personal computer hardware business was pretty chaotic. I always wanted to have enough cash to pay everybody for a year. Uh, and still to this day, Microsoft has enough cash to pay everybody for a year. Uh, uh, more than a year, I think. <laughs> yeah, more than a year. <laughs> so uh, when you started, uh, how did you avoid what so many other entrepreneurs are unable to avoid, which is taking venture capital money and diluting themselves? You didn't really take venture capital money. How did you avoid that? Yeah, we got software, if you can sell it in volume, has extremely favorable economics because the, you know, the costs are quite finite uh, and you, know, you can scale the volume, in our case, to sell millions of copies. You know, every Apple II computer, Commodore PET, IBM PC had copies of our software. So our income went up a lot. So we, we didn't have to build any factories. Uh, we were cash positive and we didn't have a year where we lost money. Uh, you know, the first few years, okay, Paul and I worked for free, Paul Allen, who was, who was my co-founder. But after that, we were just generating cash. We eventually gave away or sold 5% of the company uh, for a million dollars, so a 20 million valuation, just to get a venture capital company uh, to join our board and give us some adult advice uh, about various things, which actually was, was quite helpful. We picked one in the Valley, a guy named Dave Marquardt came on our board and did a fantastic job. That money sat in the bank, it's still in the bank today. So it was wow. not for anything to do with capital, but rather okay. just to join the team. And he's still on the board. Yep, he's still on the board of Microsoft and is still extremely helpful as a lot of uh, important decisions get made. So when you were starting, Steve Jobs was also starting uh, his company not long 
after. Yeah, after. he was in India when we started, a, a year later, yeah. Okay, so um, and when his software was developed at one point, it was thought to be very good software, but he didn't want to license it. Was that helpful to you because his software was so good at that time that you're, if he had licensed it, there would have been no need for IBM or others to license your software? Yeah, it's a little complicated. So there's three phases of Apple. There's the Apple II era, uh, where Wozniak did, Steve Wozniak was a great engineer, did the Apple I software. Then he got kind of lazy, uh, or wasn't focused on it, so I got to do the Apple II basic okay. and license that to Apple. Then there's the Mac era, uh, where they did all their own system software, and we were the big application provider for the Mac. And, and because we were doing so well with our Mac application software, we kept telling Apple they should license their software to other people, because it would have been better for Microsoft, although ironically, that would have comp competed with MS-DOS and Windows. They, for a while, thought about doing it and then chose not to do that. Um, and then, then comes the era sort of post-Mac, where they do all the, the different things uh, and still keep it proprietary to them. So truthfully, if they had done it in the Mac era, that would have been good for us because our okay. application share was so, so strong. And we totally believed in the licensing model. You know, today, uh, Windows and Android follow the licensing model and have a very high share, although Apple's managed on a, a reasonably modest share by our standards to make right. an incredible amount of money. Now, IBM uh, decided to build a PC and they wanted to get somebody to provide the software. They thought, I guess, that hardware was the most important thing and they'll have some software provided by somebody. Uh, how did you manage to get that contract and do you think IBM made a mistake by not buying the software from you as opposed to licensing it from you? Yeah, they certainly made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> they. But they, you know, IBM's a great company that's done many, many great things. The actual project that did the IBM PC was started by the IBM Management Committee more to prove that they could do products quickly. They were seeing four-year cycles between when they decided to do something and something shipped. So they had a facility in Florida, Boca Raton, that had done a product system that hadn't done well. So they told them, you guys do a personal computer, and try and do it in 18 months, and your strategy is going to be to use third parties. So they went to Intel for the chip, UPS for the software, a group called Computer Land for the distribution, and the goal was just to do it really quickly. And so we wrote the software for that. The volume projections they had for it were like two or 300,000 units over a three-year period. So they didn't view it as important. Ironically, then, that thing was hyper-successful. And so the divisions that did the dedicated word processor, the small business machine, they got completely taken over by this tiny little group. And so the fact that they didn't know it was going to be such high volume meant that the way they negotiated with us, we thought it was going to be super high volume, and they didn't. And you know, then it, that can lead to them right. thinking they got a good deal, which they didn't. Okay. So in those days, uh, you were a rival a bit uh, for Apple to some extent with Steve Jobs, but uh, at one point he needed money and you put up some money to bail out Apple. What was that like when he had to come to you to get money? Well, yeah, so, they, so in the Apple II era, we did software for them and we were kind of friendly competitors. Then when they started the Mac, Steve came to us and we actually put more people on the Mac than Apple had because we wanted to do all this application software. We were really very much partners. Then Steve gets kicked out of the company. He's not the CEO during right, that period right. at all, but he is the head of the Mac project and, and so we're working closely. Then Scully comes in, he's gone. Then there's this management that wasn't doing so well that was negotiating with us on a bunch of things and it was taking forever. I think it had been a year of negotiation. And so when Steve comes and takes over the company, he sort of said, hey, of the, I want it, this, this, and this, and I'm gonna give you this, this, and this. And so we did the deal in three days, uh, including putting money into the company. We bought, I think, 6% of Apple, which uh, our lawyers thought for antitrust reasons we shouldn't hold on to. Would have been nice if we had. Uh, <laughs> But we mostly, besides the cash, we committed to do our Mac application software okay. and really support the company. And then Steve, through great management, turned the company around first on the Mac and then did a bunch of new products that made it 
uh, extremely valuable. Before all that happened, you took your company public, I think, in 1986 or so? Exactly. And you were 31, more or less, right? So you're 31 years old, and you're very, very wealthy, at least on paper. Um, did you think at the time that the company could actually get much bigger than it had been? And did you realize how wealthy you were? Did it change your life? Or you just kept working as hard as before? You didn't really pursue any outside activities after you realized how wealthy <laughs> you'd become at 31? Well, I was very fanatical about the job. Uh, and so there wasn't any spare time. I mean, in my 20s, I didn't believe in vacation or weekends. In my 30s, I started believing in weekends. Um, and then it wasn't until I met Melinda I started believing in vacations. Uh, now I, I believe in multiple vacations. I mean, I've completely uh, given up fanaticism. But fanaticism is for has people in their 20s and 30s by and It has and its large. virtues. Uh, and so it's very abstract that there was that value. I did start to read up about foundations because the idea that someday, maybe in my 60s, I thought at the time, I'd have some resources right. to give away, and how would you do that? Uh, I remember seeing the Fortune magazine cover where Warren talked about, Warren Buffett talked about that it's not necessarily a favor to your kids to leave huge sums of wealth to them. And I, I read that thinking, oh, this might be relevant to me someday. Uh, that was before I'd met and become, uh, right. later got to be very good friends with Warren. I thought, oh, this is pretty wise. I hadn't considered uh, the distortionary effects of this. So, so it didn't change my life at the time, uh, but... Oh, well, okay. So you take the company public, you're still run, running your tunnel visions and so forth. But one thing I wanted to ask you about with respect to the software that you created, um, which I've used for many years and many people here have as well. Why, when I want to turn on my software and computer, do I need to have three fingers? Control, Alt, Delete. What is that? Where is that from? <laughs> what, what, where, whose idea was that? Uh, basically, because when you turn your computer on, you're going to see some screens and eventually type your password in, you want to have something you do with the keyboard that is signaling to a very low level of the software, actually hard-coded in the hardware, that it really is bringing in the operating system you expect, instead of just a funny piece of software that puts up a screen that looks like a login screen, and then it listens to your password, and then it's able to do that. So we could have had a single button. Uh, that the guy who did the IBM keyboard design didn't want to give us our single button. And so we had, we programmed a little level that you had to do, it's, it was a mistake. We did some very clever things. The IBM keyboard, PC key uh, character set, usually you have 128 characters, like the lowercase and uppercase. But we took the upper ones and we put like right. suit symbols in and we were, we were able to experiment with a lot of stuff, but more on the software side than the hardware. Okay. So you're running the company and it's becoming very, very uh, big and bigger and bigger and you're becoming wealthier and wealthier. At what point did you say, I've got so much money, I've got to do something with it? Was it your father who came to you and said, Bill, you've got to do something with this money and maybe create a foundation? What, what created your first foundation? What was the impetus behind it? Yeah, so uh, I get married in January 1994. Uh, my mom passes away that year. Uh, and then my dad is sort of saying to me, hey, you're getting all these requests. Uh, why don't you just send them to me? And I'll sort of sort through them and show them to you, and you can decide uh, if you want to fund some of them. So he's looking at any general request that came in. Then another, a really capable Microsoft executive, Patty Stonecipher, decided to retire. And I wanted to put computers in libraries all over the world. Uh, and so she created an entity that was doing that. Um, and so we went from like 94 to 97, where we had those two different things. And it was a total of maybe 150 million a year being given away. Then, because uh, they, were, they had complementary skills, we put it together into one foundation for Patty to be the CEO of in, in 1997. So it built up uh, from my dad sort of saying, saying it. And I, you know, I told my dad, look, this money is still increasing in value, and I'm pretty busy. But he said, no, I'll make it easy for you. And it was nice, because then I, I got down the learning curve a little bit 
Um, so you, you're obviously a very smart, very driven person, very focused. Um, did you ever think it would be difficult to find a spouse that would be able to keep up with you? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, right. not, not keep up, but uh, you know, I, I think everybody worries about whether there's some match for, that... Uh, so how did you happen to meet uh, your wife? Well, she, she was working at, she graduated... Well, there was, there's an element of luck. Uh, she graduated <laughs> from Duke and she went to work for Microsoft, as I understand it, and then how did you happen to actually meet her? And was that uh, comp complicated, dating somebody who is working in your own company? Yeah. I mean, there's... Uh, we were... She didn't work very directly for me. Uh, and, uh, and at first we weren't serious at all. I mean, I was serious about work and she was serious about work. And um, then it kind of surprised both of us that like, wow, I actually might like to spend a lot of time with this, this person. So it kind of snuck up right. on us, I'd right. say, uh, in, a, in a good way. Okay, so now you, uh, your, your foundation is now the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, you decided, you know, I think at the age of 50, more or less, to retire from Microsoft and to devote the rest of your life, more or less, to philanthropic things. So why did you decide to do it at, let's say, 50? And, and was it difficult to withdraw from running a company you had built and, and to really devote the rest of your life to something different than what you had been doing for 20 or 30 years? Well, certainly in my 20s, Microsoft was everything. You know, every minute, every sense of hey, am I doing good work? Uh, you know, I knew everybody's license plate. I could tell you when they drove into the parking lot, when they left. Uh, you know, so it's kind of extreme. And so you're, okay. you're uh, going from that uh, to, you know, having a wife, having kids, having vacations. And, uh, you know, that felt really good. It felt like it was appropriate. There comes a point where you feel like, okay, what I'm doing at at the foundation has more of a unique ability to take pieces, take science, take economics, take system change delivery and put those pieces together and get the story to the people who need to hear it. It felt like it really was a ground for opportunity. And, and it was great that the foundation, you know, by the time I switched, which is five and a half years ago, it had by then uh, 250 employees and was running quite well. Uh, so I wasn't doing it from scratch. It just was beginning to grab my attention. And so I decided, okay, I'll make that my full-time endeavor. Um, and that it used the things that I enjoy about meeting with scientists and trying to do things that are high risk, but if they work, might have a, a, a big impact. And you know, at some point, you got to flip from your primary thing is uh, your business to the, your primary thing being the philanthropy uh, and, and so I, ma I made that okay. change which is a big change for me. So you have uh, famously decided that two major areas of the foundation, one is K-12 to education in the United States, another is health care in emerging markets, particularly in Africa. How did you come to those two uh, areas as the ones you wanted to focus on and was it difficult for you to actually come to an agreement among yourself and let's say uh, Melinda about what you wanted to focus on? Yeah, the global health thing it was pretty straightforward. Um, it's easy not to be aware of the, the number of children who die and the ill health. You know, if you're a poor child, you have 50 times more chance of dying before the age of five uh, than a person in the rich world. And that's partly because you're not getting the right medicines, partly because uh, if you live in equatorial areas, things like malaria are threatening you and not threatening the, the rich countries. So the idea that that's the greatest inequity in the world, you know, jumped out at us, both from a visiting Africa and parts of Asia and a numeric point of view. You know, many people think that, okay, Syria is terrible. Yes, it's incredibly terrible, uh, but a, a few hundred thousand over several years is less than six million per year. Now, that's the number of uh, children under five would die. When the foundation got started, it was 12 million. And, uh, you know, so over a period of about a decade, it's gone from 12 million a year to about six, a little more than six million a year. And we'll get it down uh, in our lifetime to under a million a year. Uh, so the equity between the poor and the, the rich will largely be eliminated. So that one was clear. 
Then the question was, okay, given that we live in the United States, the framework of business, law, education, um, Lakeside, Harvard, uh, that allowed the fortune to be created was here in the US, and so what do you do to give back? And there we picked education, um, because in terms of equity or economic growth, uh, in our view, that's the big missing piece because it, it's not operating very well, and if it can operate well, it, it has this monstrous effect. So, and that was pretty easy uh, to agree on because we had a lot of chats about it, and neither of us really varied from that at all. Okay. So um, the foundation is called the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Suppose you disagree on what to do. How, how do you decide what to do? Just it's like raising kids. I mean, you talk and talk work and work it out. Uh, okay. You know, there's so, quid pro quo. Somehow it all, always works out. It's never been uh, that difficult because we're talking about what people should we pick and what organization structure. We're going off on different trips, and it's a lot of fun to talk about it. You know, in Microsoft, I had that relationship with Paul Allen for the first ten years or so. Then I had it with Steve, where even though I was CEO for most of it. And he was. We ran it together. Now the foundation. Okay. Uh, Melinda is amazing at playing that role. Okay. So um, today, uh, let's talk about Warren Buffett. You mentioned him. Uh, how did you actually get to meet Warren Buffett initially? Um, and how did you develop such a close relationship with him? Well, it was a very strange thing. My mom said that she was having Kay Graham and Warren Buffett and a bunch of people to a party uh, on July fourth and I needed to come. And I said, I'm working, Mom. Uh, mm. And she said, no, 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 you have to come. Uh, so I said, okay, I'll take a helicopter out to this place, stay two hours, and then I'll go back. And that, that seemed to satisfy her. Uh, so I went out, and I met Warren. And I thought, hey, what do I have in common with this guy? This guy buys and sells stocks. You know, what does that do to the world? It's just paper. Uh, and, you know, the fact that people look at like trends and volumes and they see things going on in those wiggling things, it's not that right. big value added, right. really. Uh, yeah. And so he started to ask me questions that no one had asked me about the computer business, the software business, why IBM hadn't been able to do this, what we were good at, why other companies hadn't come along, what we were doing about growth, pricing, just all the questions that you know, I sat and thought about uh, and so then I thought, well, hey, this guy asked good questions. So I, I was asking about banking and loans and well, why he invested in certain things. They, but not in terms of the prices of the stock, but the dynamics of the businesses, the people, the products, the pricing. And I, you know, he basically said, I say I, I fell in love with Warren that day. He was so interesting, and we've been super close friends ever since. So you play bridge a lot with him, and what is it like to have two of the smartest and maybe the two wealthiest people in the United States, and you're playing bridge and you lose? Is that very humiliating? I mean, you're very wealthy guys, you're very smart, and you play bridge and you don't win? Well, we, Warren and I uh, love to play bridge. It's very relaxing, you know, great game, you can play it online. There are thousands of, of truly great bridge players that are way better than we are. Uh, you know, for amateurs, we're pretty good, but it's, it's relaxation. And so we play with people who are way better who point out to us mistakes okay. that we make. Um, you know, it's, it's a fun, so, fun endeavor. So we don't ever bat or anything. So what did you, well, I guess you don't need to make any more money, so you <laughs> right, right, right. So what do you, what did you think when uh, he called you up one day and said, guess what, I'm gonna give you the bulk of my fortune to your foundation. Were you shocked, and why do you, how do you think he came to that? Well, it's a, when I, most of the time I knew Warren, from 1994 uh, on, he was in the mode I'd been in for a while, which is that he felt his wealth was accumulating, uh, and so it was probably best uh, that it be given away later. Uh, or he just liked <laughs> having the, the capital to accumulate. He assumed that uh, he would die before his wife Susie, and uh, she was given the responsibility to run a foundation and, and give it all away. Tragically, she died before he did, uh, and this is about mm, seven and a half years ago now. And it was kind of unusual, a, a 
a few months after that, he said to me, you know, the logical thing would be for me to give money to your foundation. And that's all he said. He said that would be the logical thing. And I thought about it and I thought, well, we are, we are large scale. Okay, I guess that'd be logical. But it wasn't like he was going to do it or anything. Then the next time I saw him, he said, you know, it really would be logical. And I thought, he, he may be serious about this. So I, told, I said to Melinda, he might actually be thinking about this. And it was completely out of the blue. And then a month after that, he talked to his kids, made uh, very generous uh, gifts for them to create foundations. Uh, actually, they'd had for smaller foundations, but, but made them quite substantial. And so, uh, and there was another foundation uh, focused on reproductive health things. So a total of five foundations uh, got resources, but a, a large, large percentage came to us. So it was a fantastic thing. And we were able to take our mission in health and add agriculture. We were able to take our mission in K through 12 and add uh, some uh, college right. uh, level stuff. So it's really enabled us to scale up what we do very dramatically. So what are the assets now of the foundation? Yeah, the assets are 36 billion, but the gift Warren gives on a yearly basis, uh, stock that's now worth uh, 2.3 billion a year uh, to the foundation. Berkshire's had a uh, particularly right, right. good year, and and so the the corpus that I'm saying that's the the money I put in. So you actually have to almost double it in terms of the uh, the yearly payout. So how much are you giving away a year annually? We're just over four billion a year. Four billion. Yeah. And how do you um, the measure the success of the money that you give away? Do you have very good <laughs> metrics, or you just don't really have perfect metrics? I guess there are no perfect metrics, but how do you follow up and make sure that's being used the way you want? Well, some things are pretty straightforward to measure. You know, the number of children who die every year, the way that number's measured, it's accurate to within uh, certainly plus or minus 5%. And so if your goal is to drive that number, you know, from 12 million to 6 million, which is where we are now, and from 6 million to 1 million, you either succeed or you don't succeed. That one requires tons of partners. That's not just us. That's development aid budgets and delivery organizations. But we're part of that movement. and and you know, really pushed a lot of new science, including new vaccines into it. So then you have more near-term things, like have you discovered a malaria vaccine or an AIDS vaccine or a TB vaccine? And you look at the scientific progress there. And that is a little softer, but you, you, you can tell. In education, uh, if you're giving scholarships, that's straightforward. If you're putting computers into libraries, that's straightforward. If you're trying to help improve the K through 12 personnel system, so that the average quality of teaching is much better. That is, the really good teachers share their secrets and certain incentives and professional development are put in so that the average uh, moves up to the, the top quartile uh, from the, today's average to the top quartile today. That, because it's subject to so many uncertainties, including school boards, political processes, union negotiations, desire to maintain the status quo, if you said to me, are we making progress on that one or not, I could talk for a long time, but I wouldn't be able to give you a number. Uh, and so, you know, the very risk of it and the, the complexity of the system change that's necessary makes that tougher to measure. I'm a total fan of measurement, you know, where it can be done, but to the degree that would drive you to low risk things and steer you away from trying to improve K through 12 U.S. education, then the uh, fetish towards measurement, measurement can be taken too far. So uh, your foundation is not to be a perpetual foundation. As I understand it, 50 years after the last spouse dies, it's to be terminated. Is that more or less Yeah, right? we lowered it from 50 to 20. 20, okay, sorry, so 20. So what is the theory behind doing it after just 20 years? Why not have it like the Ford or Rockefeller Foundation go on forever? Well, those in perpetuity foundations are amazing, and we partner with a lot of them. For us, the theory is that we picked some causes, education, you know, global health, and we can actually see childhood death uh, in our lifetime getting to be pretty small. And so we have this very specialized or organization. You know, we have malaria experts. We have vaccine manufacturing experts, 
We are an institution. It's not just the amount of money we give. We are about global health. We have people who think, you know, have done 20,000 hours of videotaping of good teachers, mediocre teachers, looked at what that is, thought about teacher training. So it's a purpose-built organization. And we think that whatever our ideas are about change, in our lifetime plus 20, you know, they'll, they'll either work or not work. And then it's up to rich people who are alive, who are looking at the current problems and politics and technology and understanding of learning to decide, you know, to give their money as opposed to picking, you know, some weird board uh, who God knows what they would do. Uh, All right. All right. You know, and, and there will be plenty of money, uh, but that's just our choice not to perpetuate Okay. some name because these missions don't they're not you know they will be solved by someone hopefully us but by somebody within the next 40 or 50 years okay so today you have a large number of people working at the foundation as 800 people or something like that so um it's a bit of a bureaucracy 800 people is a lot so if you decide you want to do something do they do what you want or do they kind of come back to you and argue and you have a hard time getting things done through your own foundation or that's not a problem well, we get, we get them to argue with each other. Uh, okay. it's the, if you only have one person who works for you, that, that could be very difficult. Uh, now, seriously, it's, it's, as, it's like Microsoft was with about 1,000 people, where the understanding of the analytics, the bias towards the action, the understanding the different mixes of uh, skill sets that are required, it's pretty exciting to go in I spent this morning discussing our pneumonia strategy because there's some partners here in Boston who are, who are part of that strategy. It's really fun uh, to go through the discussion about which paths okay. we ought to take. So it's, sure there's debate, um, but you have a lot of knowledge. Uh, you know, these, many of the problems we work on, uh, it's amazing how little has been put into them, like malaria or pneumonia or diarrhea or designing t new toilets. It's amazing how little has been done. So you spend a lot of time traveling the world, as does Melinda, uh, meeting with government officials. Is it ever hard to get a meeting with a government official for you, or they always welcome you because they think you're going to bring a lot of money? They've been very nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Now, it's, it's, it's great. The, the ability to take things like their childhood death rate and get that higher on their priority, you know, to have them understand how they compare to other countries, what it is about the way they organize primary health care that's not working. The, you know, the way they normally pick a cabinet and the way democracy normally works, the great injustice of ill health and the fact that that actually paradoxically means they have very high population growth and therefore feeding people and maintaining stability is going to be very difficult. That's not, you know, part of their, people aren't coming in and educating them that on, on a day to day. But yeah, the access um, has, has been super good. Uh, once I wanted to go see Gaddafi and Melinda made me hesitate uh, and then he got killed. So I never okay. uh, got so, to see him. Um, how do you deal with the problem of wealth and your children? You have three children. So obviously growing up as the children of Bill and Melinda Gates obviously has some pluses and some non pluses, let's say. Um, how do you deal with wealth and how do you get them interested in philanthropy as well? Well, it's certainly distortionary to have parents who are well off and, or just to have parents who are well known. Um, and, you know, we've said to the kids that the money's going to the foundation, not to them. And so they won't be uh, accepted. What they, was their they, reaction to that? They, well, every year they're, you know, thinking about that uh, and uh, get to ask about it. You know, I don't think kids want that. I mean, partly because they, they've been told that all along, but I don't think a kid ever comes in and says, yeah, I should have, you know, $500 million. I, I should be able to sit around. I should be able to buy a sports team. I mean, what the heck? Right. Uh, <laughs> it... In terms of your own contribution to society, what you learn, you know, go off, be a doctor, go off, be a scientist, go off, be a social worker. If you have this pile whose, who's, you know, sort of leverage of it being used well kind of exceeds 
any individual contribution, I think that would be a you know, very strange thing. And it's not just you who sees that, it's your friends, everybody around you, um, and you, know, you kind of stick out. You're not going to have to ever worry about uh, certain things. So we've said that to them, and, and you know, they know we're quite sincere. They've had a chance to travel the world and see these things, but we're not saying to them that they'll have any role at the foundation, or they'll have their own foundations, nothing like that at all. But now you've decided to leave them some money, but a modest amount. Yeah, there's this thing about you know, enough, so they'll never right. uh, Do need nothing. anything but enough, so they'll have to work. That number probably doesn't exist, so okay. uh, you know, we're probably leaving them a little too much for one of those goals and, and okay. too little for the other one. But. So how do you compare the emotional and intellectual excitement of building Microsoft with the intellectual and emotional excitement of solving the problems you're dealing with now? Are they different, and what is more rewarding for you, or has been? I think when you're young, the very hands-on stuff where you're writing the code yourself and you've just got to prove, you know, do I understand this? Can I, I get this done? I think that's just phenomenal. Uh, so I was very lucky to, to have that experience. Then as Microsoft got larger, my role was more indirect uh, in terms of picking teams, backing teams, picking general directions. And so my role when I I left my full-time work at Microsoft, and what I'm doing now at the foundation is very similar. Now the domains, I have to understand vaccines and northern Nigeria dysfunction. Uh, so the problems, the specifics on the problems are, are different, and that's let me broaden the kind of science exposure that, that I get, uh, which I've enjoyed. But it's pretty darn similar to my, what I was doing in my 40s at Microsoft, what I'm doing in, in the foundation now. So you meet a lot of very smart scientists now. Um, have you met some who say these people are so smart that I, I, even I can't keep up with them? There's no Oh, way. absolutely. Uh, they're, it, people, the world is very specialized. You know, it's like these people who play bridge. They are, uh, you know, I don't, I don't care how much general extra IQ you bring to the problem. Uh, you know, you are not going to catch up uh, to that. And likewise, in all these areas, the foundation works. And, you know, there are some people who just, when it comes to the sciences, are, are really unbelievable. Now, it's very fun to have those people around. And part of the reason I'm willing to learn a lot of science is I know if I ever get confused, uh, there are people like Nathan Mirabold, Lowood, I can just send mail to and say, I don't know, I'm a little confused about this, straighten me out. So you don't, you don't ever feel like you're going to hit a dead end in terms of uh, your understanding. So do people come to you all the time and say, I'd like your advice about something, but they really want your money? You oh, ever sure. had that? And so you, yeah, you've probably done that to someone. I, I, not to me, you haven't. Okay. <laughs> Ser seriously. But yeah, sure. Uh, so um, how do you deal with requests that um, are not in your core areas, your foundation? People come to you, they might be friends of yours, or they might be some other things that you might be interested in, but just not in your core areas. You just basically, how do you, how do you learn to say no to all these requests? You must get an incessant amount of them. Well, if it's coming from a stranger and it's not in an area the foundation works, then it's very easy to say no. You know, we don't do cancer. It's great that people do. It's very, very important work, but we don't. And, you know, so that's easy. If it fits into the foundation, then because of our scale, we have a staff that can look at things and really evaluate. You know, if anybody has ideas about malaria, great. Uh, we look at every idea about malaria in, 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 in great depth. The tough thing is when it's people who you have relationships with, friends, or people that you've asked money for, uh, then you have to consider it. And you know, it's probably wise to set aside uh, you know, 10, 15% of your philanthropy for uh, socially related. And not, they're not terrible things. Some of them are, are gonna be things you kinda go, oh geez. Uh, okay, <laughs> so, um, all right, so sometimes you, you do make some exceptions, but let me ask yeah, you. Yeah, I'm not if, pure. Um, what would you say is the most exciting thing you have done with your money in terms of giving it away? What was, is there some achievement that you're really particularly proud of? I know it's ongoing, but is there one or two things you would cite and one or two things you would say is a regret that you wish you hadn't done with your money? Oh, what we're doing uh, to eradicate polio, uh, which if we're lucky by 2018, it will become 
the second disease after smallpox to be completely eradicated. That is really exciting. Uh, and, you know, it's down to three countries, Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and, you know, it's complicated. Uh, I'll meet on Monday with the president of Nigeria, the president of Pakistan, you know, we're still very hopeful. That is pretty exciting because we've had to bring, you know, satellite mapping, using cell phones, better vaccines, and reaching out to religious leaders. A lot of, of different things have come together. I'd say in terms of what's measurably been done, the work on childhood death uh, and childhood sickness, that's what we're most proud of, and that's largely been done through vaccines. It would be great if our education stuff worked, uh, but that we won't you know, know for probably a decade. If polio succeeds, then we'll take on malaria and measles in the same way, try to go uh, in our lifetime for the eradication of those. So um, what would you like to see as ultimately your business legacy and your philanthropic legacy? Obviously, you've got a long way to go, but if today you were to say, what, this is what I accomplished in business I'm most proud of, and this is what I've accomplished to date in philanthropy, what would you say they are? Well, business is hard because, you know, Microsoft was a significant part of the creation of the software industry, the personal computer, which led to the internet. And, you know, there were many other companies, some of them, you know, uh, yes, Steve Jobs there and did important work, but there's like a lot of other people too. He and I were the most prominent, but history always kind of oversimplifies. You know, there were people who did things that completely failed, but were very suggestive of the right answer to things. So the competitive dynamics you know, leads to these, uh, some of these markets, winner take all, you know, type results, uh, you know, where today you're seeing Google, Facebook, and certain elements uh, benefit from those dynamics. So I can't really characterize, you know, personal computing, internet software happened a little bit better, a little bit faster, but you can't really pull out one individual's thing. You know, even if you took a company, if you said Microsoft, then there's a much bigger contribution, but even so, you know, saying that it's trying to do some counterfactual on that is very hard. So I don't think you can ever sum up okay. a contribution. Um, well, would you say, take a look at your life. You have a life that most people would envy, a lot of money, a wonderful family, very well respected, uh, successful in everything you've touched. Are there any regrets in your life? Can you make the rest of us feel okay that something <laughs> isn't perfect in your life and you have some regrets so we can just feel we're more simpatico with you in that way? No, I'm super, super lucky. And you know, I wouldn't trade places with anyone uh, close to my age. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. You know, there's tons of things that I'm not good at, and so the question is always, can I get somebody involved in a, you know, certain day-to-day -day management things, negotiating things, political things, scientific experts who really do have the time to focus in on one thing, like I did in, in my 20s, and just really, really see all the, the possibilities. And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm known for being fairly tough uh, sometimes. I think I'm mellowing. I'm more, you know, trying to be more generative in these things. So I have work to do uh, on those uh, things. You know, so, my wife always gives me good feedback uh, so on those things. If you had not, um, if Microsoft hadn't really taken off, let's suppose, had you ever thought what you would be doing today or what would you would have done with your life? In other words, suppose Microsoft just turned out to be another software company that didn't make it, of which there were thousands in those days. Um, what do you think you'd be doing now? Well, software is pretty magical stuff. So even if I'd been consigned to a pretty modest role in the software game, software in the uh, you know, 1980 to even now, and we're just at the beginning because uh, speech, vision, you know, software's getting really good. And some great holy grails of that industry that I sat and dreamed about as a freshman here at Harvard uh, were finally making uh, great progress on, on those things. So even if I had had to do a fairly small company, uh, I don't think I would have ever felt like, oh, I should go be a lawyer, uh, which my dad was, and when I was very young, I. I originally thought that's what I would do, or a mathematician, which you know has certain prestige, but very few people get to contribute to it. Uh, 
so software, either software research or even having a modest software company, I think that, that there are eras where certain kinds of endeavors are having more impact. You know, it's not like I think, oh, I wish I'd been doing auto engineering in the 1980s. I'm not trying to denigrate the people who are doing auto engineering, but it wasn't in a, an exponential change the world type mode. You know, today there are certain things in biology, hopefully in energy, still in the software IT space. So there's more domains now that are changing the world. So, you know, young people have more choices where they could, they could and I'm not saying economics, just in, in terms of their IQ having huge impact, there's more choices today than, than when I was young. So given the financial success you have and all the things you have today, would you give them up for 10 additional years of your life? Let's suppose you could be 10 years younger, but you had to give away all your money, but you know you're going to live 10 years longer and have good health in that. Or would you be happy with where you are? I'd uh, for 20. 20, okay. <laughs> um, we can <laughs> negotiate for 15. Yeah. Now, you're obviously a, uh, the world's largest philanthropist. Um, but you've also tried to proselytize a little bit on philanthropy by starting the Giving Pledge with Warren Buffett and Melinda. Can you explain what the Giving Pledge is supposed to do? Well, it grew out of a dinners that Warren said, hey, let's go talk to people who are doing philanthropy and see how they got into it, what they like about it, you know, what do they think about staff or causes. And so we had actually four dinners um, and it, and it was wonderful to hear people's passion and the different things they were working on. And we weren't trying to convince them to give to our causes, and except for very few cases they were trying to convince us uh, to give theirs. It really was just sharing about giving. And at the end of each of those dinners, people said, hey, what should we do to maybe get other people to start younger or to feel less isolated that they could learn from each other about this thing and draw a bit more, more people in because we think they, they'll feel good about it. And we talked about a, a few constructs. So this idea of a pledge to give more than half, that the very most successful uh, could come together in a group that had done that and learn from each other, share experiences, positive and negative to each other, that sort of came into being. And amazingly, uh, when we first called around, I think we got about 35 people fairly quickly uh, into it. You know, you joined very early on, and, and now it has been. It's a yearly get-together, although there's uh, more special learning sessions that people go to, about three or four of those here. It, I've met a lot of interesting people. I've learned a lot. Uh, and you know, I think people are a little smarter and starting a little earlier. So you um, now have a long time to probably continue doing what you're doing. Um, but do you think you'll ever slow down and really let's say, relax in a traditional sense, or you're going to be driven like this for another 10, 20, 30 years? Hopefully, I, I can stay, you know, at a high level of intensity uh, into my 80s. I'd like to. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I'm not very good at golf. Um, did you, you did take up golf, right? Not really. No. I, I mean, I, 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 I was out there hitting the ball, but uh, I never... You should try uh, what I do. You that. should try what I do, which is miniature golf. It's a lot easier. <laughs> uh, but so, um, have you ever thought when you do slow down, if you ever do slow down, maybe in your 80s, you might come back to Harvard to complete your degree? <laughs> a couple credits left. Well, I don't know. I I take a lot of college courses. The uh, online free stuff has gotten very good. Uh, in these new MOOCs where Harvard's doing edX and there's Coursera, Udacity. But the, the learning company DVDs, uh, now they have streaming, uh, finally. But, you know, meteorology, biology, geology, I highly recommend, you know, I just took oceanography uh, last month. These are really, really good courses. So it's kind of ironic that I'm a dropout because I love college courses probably right. as much as anyone around. Well, you've had a remarkable life, and uh, you're obviously a very famous person who's attended Harvard, and uh, Harvard's very proud of you, and uh, we very much appreciate your giving us this time today. Thank you, Bill. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.